Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Mondays with Monday, and that's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. This is our first episode broadcast in March, which, as we know it more commonly today, is Women's History Month, even though every month is Women's History Month and every day is Women's History Day. But but what do we know about women's history at the League? Uh, you wouldn't think there's much at all, because um, if you think of the League in the 19th and 20th centuries and try to describe it, uh, the seven adjectives I come up with are White Anglo-Saxon Protestant Conservative Republican Men's Club. But think of that league as that historical onion. And once you start to peel back all these different layers, you're going to find some women's history. So let's take a look at exactly that history about women at the league. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see my the ubiquitous PowerPoint. Okay, I do that. I do that. Slideshow. All right, come on. And we do from the beginning. Hot dogs, we made it. All right. So women at the league. So this is the league as it looked in 1863. This is the, the old Hartman Coon Mansion at 1118 Chestnut Street, occupied by the league on February the 23rd of that year. And a little more than a year later, um, would be something called the Great Central Fair in Philadelphia. It was in June of 1864. And on June the 16th, Abraham and Mary Todd Lincoln were in Philadelphia to visit the fair. It was the only fair that Lincoln visited during his presidency. And there were quite a few of them around the country. You'll notice, though, that there are men and women walking up to the League House itself and some children even at the same time. Because from the very beginning, the League House was open to the members and their wives and their families. So, so when the Lincoln carriage drove by the League House on June the 16th of 1864 on its way from Broad Street to the Continental Hotel at 9th and Chestnut. Apparently the League, every window in the front of the house was filled with women who were just waving and clapping enthusiastically and waving handkerchiefs in honor of the visit of the presidential couple. So can you imagine that in, in this stolid and staid city of Philadelphia and the League itself? goes to show that women have been part of the league from the very, very beginning. Surprise, surprise. So let's see what other contributions women have made to the history of the league itself from then until now. So on the left is an image of a banner. And the banner itself is, geez, it's about eight feet tall by about six feet wide. That banner was carried up until 1913, believe it or not. All right. And now it is on display on the second floor of the Broad Street building. On the right-hand side is a silver pitcher that was presented to the league on April the 9th of 1864, to actually to the Grand Union League of Philadelphia on April the 9th of 1864 by the Loyal Ladies Circle, Pennsylvania, which included many, many houses of the Union Leagues. So, so women, again, uh, you know, presenting these uh, symbols of patriotism to the League during the war itself, right? And, uh, and by the way, April the 9th of 1864 was one year to the date before Robert E. Lee would surrender the Army of Northern Virginia, at Appomattox Courthouse, to U.S. Grant. So, but here we have two wonderful pieces, again, that show the ladies' involvement in Philadelphia during the war, but an even greater one is coming up. It was called the Great Central Fair. And it was sponsored by the Philadelphia branch of the United States Sanitary Commission, which basically was just a subcommittee of the Union League. And it was the Union League that really first proposed the fair and helped organize it. And what made this fair unique is that there were two parallel management structures, believe it or not. There was one for men and one for women. And maybe that was the influence of the League after all. We'll never really know, but I would like to think so. So, and after all, you know, this is the 19th century Victorian period and, and women were second class citizens after all. But here, you know, the object of this fair was to raise money to buy medical supplies for the army and the Navy. And patriotism is a patriotism, right? And so men and women participated at equal levels of running this fair. Now, in the end, I'm sure the men had more responsibility, if you will. But the fact that women were invited to participate and the management and operation of this fair is extraordinarily radical for that time. And there are two women let's talk about, if you will. And actually, first, we've got the floor plan. 
So you can see all the different departments, the art gallery, uh, horticulture, or the kitchen. And then the lower along where the number four is in the lower right-hand corner, that was the children's department. Okay. So all these different departments were organized and run by these committees. And many of these committees were run by women. And so let's take a look at two. On the left-hand side, we have Helen Kate Rogers Furness. And um, in the 19th century, women tended to be identified by their husbands. And in this case, her husband was Horace Howard Furness one of the great Shakespearean scholars of the world at that point in time. And she was no slouch herself. She had already completed a concordance of Shakespeare's poems. So she knew her, she knew her stuff and she was no lightweight either. And Kate was the secretary for the children's committee, which we saw just previously. And that committee raised, or that department, I should say, raised over $15,000 to contribute towards the overall benefit of the fair itself, which raised just a little over a million dollars in the three weeks that it was open in June of 1864. On the right-hand side is probably one of the, more, one of the most, uh, I, I can't think of an adjective, ad, adequate adjective to describe Clara Jessup Moore. She was a force of nature. How, how about that? Okay. Uh, her husband was Bloomfield Moore, who with her brother, Alfred Jessup, owned the world's largest paper manufacturing company at that time. And Clara Moore um, <clears throat> was, the, was one of the founders of the Women's Pennsylvania branch of the U.S. Sanitary Commission itself. And so she was already heavily engaged in all of these um, philanthropic uh, operations during the war to help the Sanitary Commission. On top of which, she was also a founder of the Relief Committee in Philadelphia, which um, helped support the hospitals. because Philadelphia was the center of, of hospitalization during the Civil War itself. And Clara, uh, as you can imagine, uh, actually she was, in, she was on the internal arrangements committee, which is the one that basically made sure everything ran smoothly. So a very powerful and influential committee and a very powerful and influential woman at that time. So you can see how women spouses of the league were doing their part, so to speak, during the Civil War and contributing to the greater good of the city of Philadelphia. All right, now once the war was over, and politics is kind of put on the back burner a little bit, but the league was becoming a social institution as well. And here we have um, an engraving from a New York newspaper of September the 9th of 1873, and it shows a garden party on September, on September the 9th, a nice late summer evening. It must have been wonderful, if you can, as we know, Philadelphia summers can be at that time. And by the way, this is the only image of the rear of the Broad Street building that we have. And as you can see, there was a porch, stairs came down, because after all, the first floor is elevated above street level. And you can see the band uh, playing on the left-hand side and all the different couples participating in cocktails and drinks and the enjoyment of listening to the music on a, what I hope would be a cool summer's night. So, but again, women are there. They're part of the activities, the social activities of the league itself. And speaking of social activities, on April 27th of 1878, American President Rutherford B. Hayes and his wife, Lucy Hayes, were guests of honor at a special dinner for them at the Union League of Philadelphia. And here's the President and Mrs. Hayes being escorted down the Broad Street hallway. But of the grand staircase because of those two wonderful torchers as Newell Post figurines, and they're still there to this day. And so, you know, um, women were invited, all right? They were, so again, they're very much a part and parcel of the social life of the league itself, especially when it came to important events like this. But not just social events, the women had their own dining room. In 1870, the board of directors designated uh, what was then a private dining room on the first floor of the Broad Street building to become the ladies' dining room. And today we know of it as the Cafe Meredith, okay? It's on the right-hand side, second door on the right-hand side. Looks very different, obviously, but this is a photograph from the 1890s. Um, and this is what the ladies' dining room looked like. Now, at some point, I think there might have been separate tables, more tables and chairs and things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, the women now had their own place to eat in the league house itself. And that, again, you know, this is, this is Victorian America. It's a, it's a men's world. It's not a women's world at this point in time. And the club world itself was especially a men's world. So it is extraordinary, I think, that the league, as early as 1870, had 
a ladies' dining room. So now it went from this to this. And how did that happen? Well, as um, 1896, a petition was signed by 800 members. Apparently, uh, things were beginning to change from a sociological perspective, shall we say, demographically. And some of the members weren't all that happy that there were women and children running around the house itself. So let me just read to you from that petition. I think it's worth, because you, it'll give you an idea of um, just what things were like in 1896. So, to wit, the undersigned members of the Union League hold different opinions as to the admission of women to the club. Some believe in their entire exclusion. Some recognize the unsatisfactory conditions existing under House Rules 21 and 22 as present in force. Those rules grant at best but very limited privileges, but under them it has been found impossible to restrict ladies to the rooms appropriated for their entertainment as members in violation of them or persist in escorting ladies through other parts of the house to the great annoyance of members whose privacy is thus disturbed. Others seek more privileges for the ladies' members' families and desire that they be admitted to the league at all times. Wow, that's pretty neat stuff. So what happened? Nothing. 14 years go by, it's 1910. And without any warning, the board of directors just unilaterally closes the ladies' dining room. But they didn't do that, they, they moved it, shall we say. And so in October of 1911, what we think of, as some of us anyway, who have been around the league long enough, know as the more modern version of the ladies' dining room, it opened on the ground floor of the Broad Street building. And this is the ladies' dining room from a photograph in the 1950s. Okay. So to your left, uh, you're looking at what would be the, the east end of the room towards Broad Street itself. And the photograph is being taken from the west end into the east. Okay. So now the ladies, this ladies' dining room, uh, well, at this point, women weren't walking up the front steps to the Broad Street building anymore, or even the 15th Street building. Instead, they were relegated to their own private entrance on Broad Street, which is under the portico, as we know it today. And speaking of today, this space is now occupied by the Heritage Center of the Union League, which is the home of the Union League Legacy Foundation. So but be that as it may. So 1950s, um, this is where the ladies were eating, okay? But they still had access to the rest of the house in this time period for social functions. Right. Oh, and this, by the way, is the ladies' lounge. Um, if you're down in the Heritage Center, this room is, or this space is now occupied by the Hewer Room, which is where we have our exhibits, by the way. Okay. All right. And you can see it's kind of a pastiche of different periods of Louis 14th, 15th, 16th furniture and things like that. And on the far wall, you'll recognize the portrait of Martha Washington or the Broad Street Building. Okay. All right. So, as I mentioned, uh, there were still social activities that were um, being held for women. And so here we have an invitation to a ladies' night, which featured Margarita Silva, the operatic prima donna. She was the Chicago Opera Company at that point. And, a, and, she, will gave, and she gave you a presentation at home recital in Lincoln Hall, Wednesday evening, April the 11th, 1923. At the women still had their social foot in the door in the building, even if it wasn't, the door wasn't open very wide at this point in time. And here we have another ladies night, as you can see from May. Movie night, movies were in their infancy at this point in time. And this movie called The Patsy with Marion Davies and Marie Dressler, and I'm not old enough to have seen it, but I'm old enough to recognize their names. Women were invited to have dinner beforehand, and then they would go up to Lincoln Hall for the entertainment. Um, so again, um, it's all about context, isn't it? So as I said, even though they weren't, you know, they, they, they still they had their place in the league, but they had their place in the league, all right? Now that changed. Actually, think of those ladies from the 1920s and think of these young ladies in the 1950s. So this is a photograph of Date with Dad, which was first held in 1959. Uh, so, so in between the 20s and the 50s, obviously, was World War II, the Korean War. And obviously, the world had changed sociologically, demographically, culturally, 
intellectual, you name it. And so the league, which was uh, beginning to, um, to broaden its entertainment functions, shall we say, uh, created this dinner called Date with Dad. And here we see Lincoln Hall filled with fathers and grandfathers and daughters and granddaughters. Looks like they're doing the twist. <laughs> so now this isn't, I think this is 1964, but the, the event itself began in, in 1959. So I, love, I especially like that older gentleman on the right-hand side trying to twist with his grand, with his daughter, it looks like, so fun stuff. Anyway, so a few years later, actually 1962, and again, this is after the election of 1960, which was run by the Democrat, John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon lost, all right? Uh, at the end of his presidency in 1962, uh, Thomas McCabe suggested that the league start get, get reinvigorated and reinvolved in Republican Party politics. And so the next year, 1963, the league created a, a political activities committee chaired by future president, Al Bemis. And almost immediately, the league started to involve women in these activities. They would have ladies' nights that would involve political speakers. And in this one, we have, this is 19, this is uh, October of 1964. It's an American presidential campaign year again, Mary Goldwater's Republican candidate. And this was a ladies' night. And you can see all the ladies sitting in Lincoln Hall. Now, and besides just having speakers on these ladies' nights, they also raised money. And this particular event raised over a quarter of a million dollars for the Republican campaign chest that year. So, so obviously the ladies had political power as well as social power. So then in 1966, these ladies nights became formalized with the creation of a ladies committee, the ladies uh, committee. And here we have in the center, we have Mrs. Jane Schaefer, the wife of the governor of Pennsylvania, Mr. Raymond Schaefer on the left-hand side, we have Eddie Hamilton and Mr. Hamilton would be the league president in 1983 when the first vote to admit women to membership took place, even though it failed. And by the way, Betty Hamilton is still alive. Um, she's 99 or 100, but regardless, happy centennial, Mrs. Hamilton. God bless you. All right. Hope you're doing well. So from 1966 to 1967, the ladies campaign committee became the ladies luncheon committee as well. And so they would now hold annual fashion shows to raise money for the party. And here we see Lincoln Hall filled with ladies attending the fashion. It was a success then and still now. Still the hardest ticket to get in the league house during the year, by the way. So, all right, so that's 1967, all right. And from 67, 20 years later, it's 1980, actually a little bit more, 1986, the second vote to admit women to membership took place, engineered by then President Robert G. Wilder. And here we have four of the first class of women who were admitted at the board meeting on August the 24th of my Eight altogether admitted, and they are the, and that's considered the first class of women members at the league. Now, on the left, Marjorie Broderick in 1993 would become the first woman admitted or elected to the board of directors. And in 1994, a year later, Diane Allen, second from the right, would become the second woman elected to the board, as would Joan Carter in 1997. Karen Connor, uh, just uh, never got involved with the board um, at the league itself. Uh, she was busy running her own uh, ad and marketing uh, promotional at that point in time. So <clears throat> Joan Carter. So, and then in two, let's see, 1997, board, but in 2003, she would become the first woman elected as vice president of the league. And three years later, she would run for president. Uh, but lose that election to Fred Hobb. But nonetheless, uh, women are moving up, shall we say, not, maybe not the political ladder, but certainly 
the board ladder, the, the management ladder, you know, if you will, at the league itself. So then in 2011, Joan Carter, who we met previously, became the first woman elected as president of the league. And she was president in 2011 and 2012. So, and she is still, actually now she is the chairwoman of the Union League Legacy Foundation. So welcome, Madam Chairwoman. So, all right. Now, what else is going on in the league? So back to the ladies' luncheon cam committee. Um, in 1976, the Union League openly readmitted Democrats for the first time in the 20th century. And that's a, a story for a different, a different episode. But nonetheless, though, so now... Uh, it, the league is no longer going to be raising money for the Republican Party, but the Ladies Committee still marches on, and they were collecting money. And, uh, and in the 19, in the early 1990s, they 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 changed their name uh, because they were becoming more than just a ladies luncheon and fashion show committee. They they became the Ladies Committee, and here we show them in 1999, after they donated ten thousand dollars to the then Abraham Lincoln Foundation to conserve a very important battle flag from the Battle of Gettysburg. This is um, Alexander Stuart Webb's headquarters flag. He commanded the Philadelphia Brigade on July the 3rd of 1863, which basically turned back the, the last and third Confederate charge that day. So very important Civil War relic. And the ladies were the ones who stepped up to the plate and gave the money for its conservation. So, and then in just about, oh, when was it? Oh, 20... 2000, uh, they created the Crystal Award, and you can see it here in the hands of Laura Bush. Uh, the Crystal Award was created to recognize the contributions of women to the intellectual, cultural, and well being of the city, the state, and the country itself. And in 2010, Laura Bush was the recipient for that award. And it is still given out to this day, though not every year, not every year. So they're very selective who gets it. Uh, but nonetheless, it goes to show that there's trying to recognize the, the contributions of all these people to the betterment of the, of the city, state, and the country. Now they still do the fashion show. I had to get that one in and after all, because it still produces money and why not? This is a more modern version of the fashion show in Lincoln Hall. Now, last, but by no means least, uh, in, geez, I'm probably got the date wrong and that's bad for me, but around 19, early 1950s, uh, after the creation of the Boys' Work Committee, they created a scholarship committee that would raise money to, at that point, send young men off to college. Um, youth Work Committee. program from 2002, um, and you can see uh, the names of some of these scholarship recipients. So Kelly Kilgariff, all right, Mara Cirilli, Stephanie Lawler, and only one male, Richard Saunders in 2002. But you can see how Ladies Committee is now focusing their efforts on education, and they have been doing it with a vengeance, if you will, ever, ever since. And so um, obviously things have been a little different the last two years because of the COVID, pandemic, but nonetheless, the Ladies Committee has been continuing to raise money through different means for the education of these young men and women in the Philadelphia area. And so here we have the Ladies Committee presenting their check to John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. And this is January of 2022 in the McMichael Room. And it is a check for $51,000. It was the largest check yet uh, presented by the Ladies Committee to the foundation or the scholarship committee itself. And over uh, the last 25 years, approximately, since they've been focusing on scholarship, they've given oh, over a quarter of a million dollars to this campaign. So, so the ladies committee continues to function in many serious uh, and yet uh, quite vital ways to the everyday vitality of the league itself. So, and so the ladies continue to march on. Uh, and obviously, uh, let's see, Ladies have been members as we just discussed, as we've learned since 1986. Uh, we've had they've been 
president, the vice presidents, they're still on the board of directors. They are on all the different committees of the league house itself. And I believe approximately 25% of the membership itself is made up of women. So they are an active and vital part of the league itself in the 21st century. So, so I probably went on too long. I'm sure John is watching this going, Oh, Jim, stop talking. But nonetheless, it's such a good story. And I didn't, and I just, this wasn't even the tip of the iceberg. So, so I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Women at the League and learned something more about the contribution of women to the Union League uh, since 1863. So, um, so thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll have another one of these episodes in just two weeks. And given that we're still in March, I'll let you figure out what the subject might be in the next one. All right. And just because my name is James Glenn Aloysius Monday doesn't, that's not a clue. I'm sort of, maybe it is. Anyway, stay well, everybody. Stay healthy. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks very much for joining us. Goodbye.